Hello, how are you? Good, sir. I hope you're all working on your um, quiz. Yes, sir. So is anyone coming to uh, campus today? Okay, in that, case, in that case, we can start today's lecture. And today we will talk about a new thing. It's called context-free languages. Okay, so before we begin, is there any question from regular languages? Any questions? No, sir. No questions? Okay. So uh, when, we, when we started uh, talking about regular languages, we talked about finite automata and uh, we came up with this result sure. that, yes. So can you please give me one minute? I just have to submit my course. Yeah, please keep uh, working. That's why I asked everyone and nobody said yes. So you so can. Uh, the screen is first. Yeah, you can submit and I will start. Okay. So when we started talking about regular languages, um, we found that regular languages and finite automata are equivalent in a sense that everything that a finite automata accepts or, or recognizes is called regular language. And on the, on the other hand, if we have a regular language, then we know that there exists a finite automata that can accept or recognize it, okay? So we just talk about finite automata. We do not say which one, whether it is NFA or DFA, because we know that these two things are equivalent, right? So we don't have to mention that uh, uh, if we are talking about uh, deterministic finite automata or non-deterministic finite automata. Uh, so just a second, I have a message.
Okay, so we saw that uh, DFA and NFA does matter because these two things are equivalent. So whenever you have a DFA, you have an NFA or you can convert. And not only that, <clears throat> uh, if you have any regular language, which is described by a regular expression, uh, you can always construct an NFA for that. And once you have an NFA, you know that you can convert into DFA. And this is exactly what you did in your quiz as well. Um, so this is what we know from whatever that we have done uh, before. Um, and uh, today we will see that, and, and we have seen last time, and especially in the last topics, uh, which was the pumping lemma. So we used pumping lemma to prove languages not regular, right? So we know that pumping lemma applies only to regular, uh, pumping lemma applies to regular languages. And we show that if you want to prove some language is not regular, then we say that we cannot apply pumping lemma. And that will indeed mean that the language is not uh, regular. And pumping lemma, actually the, the, the important conclusion or inference from pumping lemma is, which is very important than the pumping lemma itself is, there are languages which are not regular, right? So there are languages which are not regular, which we can define uh, using a few, uh, few uh, methods. And we have defined not just one or two, several such languages which are not regular. So if those languages are if those languages are not regular, then what to do with that? Uh, because we know that uh, from our understanding of computer science that we have done, uh, we have studied so far uh, that it is possible to recognize those languages using a slightly more complicated or more uh, capable computation model. For example, if you can write um, a function in Java that 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 can recognize that uh, function. Uh, that, that can recognize a language. So it means that those language are, languages are recognizable. They, those languages are acceptable by some uh, model of computation, but finite automata is not capable enough to recognize them. So, so and, and we know that those are, there are those languages which cannot be accepted by the finite automata. And so what to do? So the first non-regular languages, uh, first kind of non-regular languages that we will study in this course are called context-free languages. Okay, so these are the first category after the regular language. So we have these regular languages. So if, if we say that this is the complete class of regular languages, then definitely if, if this is a set, then this set is an infinite set, right? It contains infinitely many languages. So there are many languages over here, and uh, we know that how to accept, how to construct a machine uh, to recognize those languages. But we know that there are languages outside uh, this, this boundary, and those for any of these languages, we cannot construct, um, we cannot construct um, finite automata, neither NFA nor DFA, uh, which would recognize those languages. So we try to find another boundary, another bigger set, which can, which, which include these languages. And we call them CFL or context-free languages. So there are languages which are not regular, but they are CFL. So this is the first kind of languages outside the regular languages. So you can see that I, I still have a few more uh, languages here, which are not even CFL. So we will find out that even uh, the tools that we will learn and uh, in, in the machines and the models that we will learn which would recognize or accept uh, context-free languages will not be enough or will not be powerful enough to recognize some of those languages. So we will look at some of those languages, not in detail, but maybe just superficially and see that uh, we cannot design, uh, we cannot create tools and machines using the, uh, in, in the context of context-free languages, uh, which would recognize those languages. And for that, we would have even bigger set which will include them and we will study later on uh, that there are other models uh, and other uh, categorization of, of uh, everything that is outside CFL uh, but we will not go into that detail and we will study a machine which is the most powerful machine to recognize any language so rather than 
Uh, I mean, talking about uh, multiple other kinds of machines, we will just talk about uh, the machines for uh, regular languages, which is the automata, and the machines for CFL, which we call push down automata. So we have FA here for finite automata. We have PDA here, the push down automata, and I will explain what is this push down automata. And then we will talk about Turing machines here. So the Turing machines are the most complicated or most uh, powerful computational model, which we will study after maybe one week. Uh, and that will be, if, and, and these machines are capable enough to recognize and accept any language that we, uh, we will throw at them. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, so the first thing outside uh, regular languages is called context-free languages, and we will now talk about that. So any questions so far? Okay, so if when we have regular languages, we have regular expressions. Okay, and regular expressions are a kind of way to define a regular language, right? Uh, for example, I say the leg, uh, a language L is a language, uh, which is all uh, bit strings of zeros and ones, right? So this is the language. How do you define this language in using regular expression? So we say that L is zero plus one star, right? So this is the way of defining regular languages, that is regular expressions. And from regular expressions, we can convert it into an NFA with empty transitions. And from there, we can convert it into an NFA and then from there, we can convert into a DFA. And this is the goal. And DFA means that we the language is regular. Okay. So similar thing happens in context-free languages. So we have context-free languages. We call them CFL. And for these context-free languages, we use a tool. We use a tool which is called context-free grammars. As regular expressions are a way or, 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 or a description mechanism to define regular languages, then context-free grammars are a way to define or describe context-free languages, right? So CFG, describe CFL, okay? So this G is for grammar, this L is for language. Uh, so context-free grammar is a way, is a mechanism in which we describe the language and that language is called context-free language, okay? So CFGs are not uh, new and they have been used extensively in many other things even before the advent of uh, computers. Uh, and uh, so basically CFGs uh, were used to describe natural languages. Okay, so natural languages like Urdu and English and Arabic and Spanish and French. So these languages can be described not completely uh, but parts of those languages can be described by CFGs. And when we had uh, a computer languages and, and, and we, when we started talking about automata and other things, we started using context-free grammars to describe many things. Uh, so for example, you can use context-free grammars uh, to describe most of the programming languages. For example, uh, you can describe Java or C or C++ or Python or many, many such languages using CFGs. Uh, you cannot use uh, CFGs to describe each and every aspect of these programming languages, but but most of the programming, uh, most of the aspects of these programming languages can be captured by CFGs. So, so what is this grammar? So this grammar is now in, in line with, uh, with our understanding about natural languages. For example, English has a, has a grammar, Urdu has a grammar, and every, almost all uh, natural languages have a grammar. So this grammar actually tells us the, um, uh, um, an algorithm or a method to construct uh, syntax, uh, 
sentences in, in a language. For example, uh, whenever whatever we say in English has a, per, a particular structure. Uh, so we have a subject, we have a verb, we have um, an object. So this thing is called grammar, right? So this is English grammar. So we have uh, tenses and other things. So this is an English grammar. This is the grammar for to describe English languages or the sentences in English languages. So whenever we, we see a, a sentence written in English, uh, we can check whether that uh, sentence is, is a correct sentence uh, or not, right? So this is exactly uh, uh, what happens in CFG. So we describe a language and this language can be described using a set, but in order to describe it mathematically or in, in precise terms, uh, which can later be used to create the machine which will accept it as, as in the case of uh, regular expressions. For example, when we define this language L here, this way, this is just a perfect mathematical description of the language L, which says that it is a language of all bit strings of zeros and one. It does not give us any clue that how we can construct a, a finite automata from this language. What, but when we define this language L using this regular expression, we know that there is a mechanism, there's an algorithm which we follow. If we follow, then uh, we can uh, convert this regular expression into the corresponding regular language or a machine that uh, accepts or recognizes the corresponding regular language, right? So this is exactly what we do with CFGs. So CFGs are a way to describe context-free languages. So once we have a description of a context-free language in terms of context-free grammars, uh, we know that there exists a way to convert the CFG into, uh, into a machine. Uh, but this conversion is not straightforward. So we will look at different other methods as well uh, for this conversion. Anyway, uh, so any questions so far? Okay, and, and the machine or the... Or the uh, uh, um, sir? Um, yes. Can you please repeat what context-free languages are exactly? I haven't defined what is context-free language, so I will define what is context-free languages. Okay. I haven't defined. Decide, I, okay. I haven't uh, described. Uh, so the machine to recognize or accept context-free languages is called uh, push down automata. Sometimes it is written as PDA. Okay, uh, but there is uh, something special about push down automata. And as you know that when we have FA, we have a DFA and NFA for deterministic and, and not deterministic versions. Uh, for push down automata, we usually don't put a D or N before this PDA. And, and this is for a reason because uh, DPDA, which is the deterministic push down automata is not same as the NPDA, which is the non-deterministic push down automata. And we will see later on that why it is the case and, and why those differences in uh, what it means in terms of uh, the limitation of the machine and uh, the, the acceptance or recognition property of the machine. Okay, so before, uh, I mean, let me uh, dive directly into an example. And from this example, I will give you some ideas that what this grammar uh, looks like and why it is called context-free and, and other things. And then I will explain uh, one by one everything. So let me call this, whatever that I would write as a grammar G. Okay, so this is a G1 grammar. So I will write here that this G1 is a grammar which says that symbol A maps to or uh, drives uh, or substitutes zero A one. So you can see that the same A is written over here on the left hand side of the arrow and as well as on the right hand side of the arrow. And I can say that A also substitutes B and this B substitutes hash, okay? Now this is called a collection of substitution rules. So these are all the substitution rules. Why do we call them substitution rules? These, this is called substitution rules in a sense that, that whenever we see a symbol A, we can replace the symbol A with this thing, which is written on the right-hand side. Whenever we see a symbol A, we can also replace this by B. So whenever we have the same symbol appearing on the left-hand side, then it means that we have a choice. We can either replace this A with this one or this one. And whenever we have B written somewhere, we can always replace this B using this rule with a hash sign, okay? So this is called uh, substitution rules or sometimes they are also called productions, okay? So these are productions or substitution rules. 
Now, you might have noticed that I only use capital letters. So capital letters represent the variables. Okay, so the capital letters represent the variable. And in this example, we do not have a small letters, but the small letters usually means uh, terminals. Okay, small letters. mean term. is the substitution represented both ways no it just goes just in one way and and i will tell you that's exactly why it is called context free right so it says that you can always replace this a with that is on on the right hand side regardless how, how or in what context this a appears it is possible that there is a zero before a or there is an a before a or there is one before a or something else before a it doesn't matter what and where it appears. So that means that regardless of the context of A, whenever you see an A, you can always replace it with 0A1 or you can replace it with B. Okay, so you can always replace it, replace this A with any of these two things, either with this one or this one. Why? Because both of uh, these productions or both of these substitution rules have A on the left hand side. Okay. I will explain it more and, and uh, we will see that what happens. So Sorry, we, by terminals, do you mean uh, constants? Yes, you can call them constants and I will explain uh, in detail that what is meant by, just give me a okay. few, few uh, minutes. So uh, in this grammar G1, we call this A, this is the start variable. Like in, uh, like in finite automata, we have a start state. So over here, we have a start variable. So start variable means that your grammar starts with this symbol. Okay, so everything, every rule that you would apply to anything will have to, that has to start with uh, su substituting this, using this symbol. Now in this particular case, there are two possibilities for this production, for, for this variable to be replaced with, either with the first one or the second one, but that's the start symbol. So the start symbol has to be A. So this zero, one, so we, we see zero here. So let me use a different color. So we have a zero here and one here and a hash sign here. So this zero, uh, the zero, one and hash are, they are called the terminal symbols. Okay, they are called the terminal symbols. Okay. And terminal symbols actually are from the alphabet. You remember the alphabet from our regular languages, right? So this is the alphabet. It means that this is this is basically this alphabet alphabet will provide you the building blocks of the strings in this language, right? So all the strings in this language, which is described by the grammar G1, will consist of zeros and ones and hash signs. That's it, no more, no less, okay? So we say that, uh, for example, in this particular case, G1 generates so many strings. So we would say, uh, let me give you some of the strings which will be generated or uh, which can be, uh, which can which we can follow the rules to find. Uh, so I will show you some strings. So G1 generates uh, strings like 0, 0, 0, hash, 1, 1, 1. It can generate zero hash one. It can generate zero zero uh, hash one one and so on. So it generates a language. It generates all those symbols in which we have the same number of zeros as the number of ones. All the zeros come before the hash sign and all the ones come after the hash sign. And there is exactly one copy of hash, right? So in order, in, in terms of um, language, you can say that this language L is basically a language uh, which has zero, n hash one n such that n is greater than or equal to one, right? So this is the language. Anyway, so this is a side note, okay? Now let's take this string Let's take this string and see that how this string is generated from the grammar. So, uh, so, so let me write the grammar here once again. Uh, I will write it here in a small. So A 
substitutes zero to a one. And I can also write it this way. So this vertical bar means or. I can either write it in two different productions or I can put a, put a vertical bar to say that uh, this or that. And B replaces or B substitutes hash. So this is exactly the same um, uh, grammar that I wrote before. So let me write that one as well. Zero A one, A replaces to B and B substitutes hash. So these two are exactly the same thing. Okay, they are exactly, they are not equivalent. They are exactly the same thing. So I have combined these two production, production one and two in a single production. And I have put a vertical line here, which, which means that either this or this or again. So, so we can apply uh, any one of them <clears throat> at any time. So, so I said that, okay, let us start with this string, which was zero, zero, zero hash one, one, one. So let me, uh, let us see that how we can apply or how we can generate this string from our grammar. So we know that the starting symbol is a, yes. Uh, why do we have the brackets? How do we have to what? Why do we have the brackets? Um, uh, oh, brackets. I, I just wanted to separate these two things. That's why I put the brackets. Okay. There's no special mathematical reason for that. I should have put okay. the braces. The braces make more sense, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. I just wanted to put them in two different boxes. Anyway, so we know the start symbol is A and it's since both these languages are, both these grammars are exactly the same. So I can forget about one of them, right? So just, just concentrate on the one that is on, on left. So we have this string. So we have to check, can we generate this string from the grammar or not? Okay. Which means, so, so the, the question is, can we generate this string from G1? So this is the question. The answer is yes, but let's see what does it mean by generate? It means that, so, so you, we know that a language is basically a collection of strings and this is one string, right? So this is one possible string. So actually the question is, so if I say that this string is S and this grammar is G1, so there must be a language L of G1, right? So L of G1 means that the language generated by the grammar G1. So the question is, does S belong to L of G1 or not? The answer is yes. So when we say generate, it means that does S belong to the language of G1. So let's see how we can check whether it is possible or not. Now, this is not the only way that we uh, use it. There are other technical things that we will discuss and, and uh, explore uh, further uh, today and in next class. Uh, but this is just one way of doing it. So we know that every string that is in this language must come from starting with the start symbol because this is the start variable. This is exactly where uh, we should start. So we know that we have the start symbol A, right? So this is A can generate something. So we know that A can generate either B or it can generate zero A one, right? So we can replace this A with this one, this production on the left hand side or this production, right? So we use this arrow, this double arrow, this double arrow means that this is the single application. So if I do not have any numbers or stars or anything uh, around this double arrow, it means that it's a single application of one of the production rules. Since A is the starting symbol and we, we can apply any production in which A appears as the left-hand symbol of this array, uh, left-hand symbol of this arrow, then we can use that production. Since there are only two productions, the, the production one is this one, A, which substitutes zero A1 or production, or production A, which substitutes B, right? So we can use one, one of them. So let's apply the first one. So when we apply the first one, we get zero A1, okay? Zero A1. Now in this, uh, in this um, uh, string that we generated, so let me write the zero and one in a different color to show that uh, these are the terminal symbols. So black means that it is non-terminal, it's a variable, and blue means that they are terminal. 
Now we have only one variable here, this A. We can apply any production rule on this uh, variable A as many times as we like, right? So let's apply production, first production again on this variable. So when we apply the production again on this A, we know this A replaces zero A one. So we would write, so this zero is from the previous production. So we would have a double arrow here and the double arrow means that we go from this string to the next one. So zero and one from the previous one. Okay, now this A over here replaces or substitutes with zero A one. So we have zero, one, A, right? Now we again have a variable and this variable can uh, again uh, be substituted with another production. So let's substitute again. So we have, we apply this, the first production one, one more time. So we have zero, 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 one, 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 and in the middle we have A, right? Now I don't have a space over here, so I will go in the next line. So I would write here this arrow. And after this arrow, I can replace this A with the second production, which says B. So I would have zero, 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 one, 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 and in the middle I would have B. So I just replace this A with B. And with this one, I can apply the second production, which is B from B to hash. So this will be zero, 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 hash, one, 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 okay? Now in this string, there is no variable. Is there any variable over here? No, there are only zeros and ones and hashes and every symbol appearing in this string is an alphabet. It's, it's, it's one of the characters from the alphabet. So there are no variables here. Since there are no variables here, so we do not have any other option to apply any of the productions. Right? So this is a terminal thing. So we stop here. So once we stop, we check, is it equal to S? Yes, it is equal to S. So our question, which was, can we generate from, can we generate this string from G1? The answer was yes. And this is why the answer is yes. Is this thing clear? So we say that the language of G1, that is, all strings which can be generated by the grammar G1 is 0n hash 1n such that n is greater than or equal to 0. So when last time I said n equal to greater than 1, so there was a little mistake here. It should be n greater than 0. Is this in clear? So every time that we have to check if a particular string is uh, or can be generated by a grammar, do we have to follow this method every time? Yes. What if we have a very long string? Doesn't matter. So what is the biggest program? I mean, what is the uh, the program? The, what is the maximum size of the program that you have written? How many lines of code it has? Ten lines, fifteen lines, hundred, two hundred, five. Sorry, sir, I did not get the question. So what is the what is the length of the longest program that you ever written in any program language? So I could not hear you. So I am saying that what is the so you must have done some programming, right? All of you. Yes. Uh, so what was what is the length of the biggest program that you have written? Uh, the length, I'm not exactly sure. Length means the line of code, yes. Um, I think in 200 or 300 lines. Okay, so 200, 300, maybe 500, somebody would can say that 1,000 or 2,000. So you can imagine that there are programs uh, in existence which have millions of lines of code, right? Millions of yes. lines of code. And every line can contain like 20, 30 symbols or more. So you can imagine the complete file that contains a code. Let's say there's a very big file containing uh, uh, maybe 5,000 uh, lines of code. Or for example, you must have, uh, you, you submitted your problem set and that problem set was written in LaTeX and LaTeX has to be passed to the LaTeX compiler, right? So, so whenever you send a file for compilation to any, uh, any compiler or interpreter, that file, 
is sent as a long string of symbols, right? And regardless how big that, uh, that um, uh, a string is, it is still a string. A string can contain two letters, two, two symbols, or five symbols, or it can contain uh, five million symbols or 10 trillion symbols, okay? So it doesn't matter. So what is the length of, uh, whatever is the length, we have to follow this procedure exactly this way. Now, uh, I can understand that uh, following this procedure on, on a very large string could be tedious and it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, error pro it's prone to errors. Uh, so we usually don't carry this procedure by hand. Uh, so we write programs uh, that do the, exactly the same thing. And those programs are called parsers. And these parsers are big part of, of compilers. Okay, so whenever, for example, you write a program in C, C++ or Java, so you write the program, let's say you have test.cpp uh, file, and you send this file to your uh, GCC compiler, for example. Okay, so this GCC compiler, first of all, will check if your file test.cpp is correct. So the correct means that the, it doesn't have any errors in it. And that is called syntax checking, right? Syntax checking. So syntax checking means that since it's a C++ program, so there's a grammar for C++. So what compiler does is it checks, it, it asks exactly this question, whatever this test.cpp represent as a, as a long string, can this string be generated by the rules of the grammar, right? Rules, the grammar of the language. And uh, so we have, we have seen a very small grammar that contains three productions, but, but see the language, uh, the complete language C, C++, Java, uh, they do not have three rules. They have like thousands of rules, right? So they use those thousands of rule on this long file. Maybe it contains 1000 lines. So, so compiler, the first step of the compiler is to check whether the input program is syntactically correct or not. And that syntactical correctness is checked by answering the question, can this string, which is represented in a test.cpp be generated by the rules of the grammar? If it can be generated by the rules of the grammar defined for, for the language, that is C++ in this case, then the compiler says, okay, and it passes the first one, first thing. And the second thing is then uh, code generation and, and, and doing other things. Now, many modern compilers combine these multiple steps in one go. So rather than doing it again and again and again, uh, they combine all these things uh, in, in one go. But traditionally speaking, the first step is to do the syntax check checking. And the syntax checking in this way that uh, they check whether the string can be generated by the rules of the grammar or not. If it can be, it says okay, and it will proceed to the next step. Otherwise, it will give you error. Then on line number, let's say 35, uh, there is an error or there's a missing semicolon or, or some, uh, some things, something is not correct. So it will uh, tell you uh, those errors. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so, so whatever I have written here is called derivation. Okay. So this is called derivation. Okay. Or we say that it is the derivation of this string using the grammar, the rules of the grammar G1. Okay. Uh, so this derivation can be shown this way, or it, it can be shown in a tree structure. And we call the tree structure parse tree. And I will show you this how this parse tree looks like for exactly the same string that we just uh, used. So it says that we can start with A and this A, since A can be replaced by uh, a production which has zero and one on both ends. So it is zero, it is one, right? Uh, and uh, not only that, it, it also generates a variable A in the middle, right? But this, this can be applied. So this, this, we can apply the same production once again to generate zero, one. And we can also generate A here. Right, and then we can uh, replace this a with again zero and and one. Sorry, so I have to change the color. 
zero and one, and this replaces this B, and this B replaces hash. Okay. Now, if you start reading from this direction and go all the way this to this direction, you read zero, 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 hash, one, one, one. Right. So this is exactly the, the parse tree. So you can either represent this derivation using the derivation that I showed, or you can construct a parse tree. So this is called parse tree. So we will see in detail that uh, what is a parse tree. And uh, so this is an example. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, so do you want a break now or since we already started late? So is it okay if we continue? break okay so so we can take a break of 10 minutes so let's come back at 7 40 it's it's more than 10 minutes 7 45 okay so i will see you all at 7 45 Okay, uh, everyone, are you back? Okay, so let us start. <clears throat> so any questions so far? So let me just revise very quickly what we did uh, so far, and then I will, uh, we will proceed. So we started looking at uh, the first kind of non-regular language. Okay. And we call this non-regular language, context-free language. Then we learned uh, how to describe uh, these context-free languages uh, using so describing context-free languages using context-free grammars, right? So we have grammars. So grammar is a description uh, thing. So we use grammars to describe a context-free language. And uh, then we saw that how to, so whenever we have a grammar, can uh, how can we use this grammar to, um, to generate a, a particular string, okay? Uh, so for example, in this uh, grammar that we have, if I ask you, is, is the string zero hash one one, I mean, does it belong to the language of LG one? The answer is no, right? Why? Because we know that it is impossible to have this string in this language, or it is impossible to generate this language using this grammar, because this grammar makes, makes sure uh, that we have equal number of zeros in one sense. In, in this string, th there are two ones and one zero, so this string must not exist uh, in, in, in the language generated by this grammar. And we know that it is impossible to generate such a string uh, following the rules of this grammar, right? So there are many strings which exist in this uh, language and there are so many other strings which do not exist in this language. So let us formally define what is a context-free grammar. So remember, when we define finite automata, there are five things. So we have similar things now. Uh, so let me write. <clears throat> so this is the definition of context-free uh, grammar. So we say that a context free grammar is a four to four tuple. And the four things are V, sigma, R, and S, okay? Where V is the set of set of variables. Okay? And this has to be finite. It cannot be infinite. <clears throat> so this is the first thing. The second thing is sigma is the set of alphabet. 
Again, this has to be finite. It cannot be infinite. And this alphabet is exactly the same as we did with the regular languages. There is no difference here. Okay. And, but, but there's one restriction here that sigma and V are disjoint. So you cannot use the same thing as a variable as well as, um, as an alphabet, right? So we call this sigma uh, as terminal symbols as well, right? So this is the name which we give. So these are terminal symbols. Terminals or terminal symbols. So there are multiple names. So you can either call it the alphabet or the terminal symbols or terminals or whatever you want to call it. Uh, number three, which we have R. R is the set of rules. Okay, again, this has to be finite. So this is the set of the rules, uh, all the rules that we have in our grammar. <clears throat> okay, so there could be no rule, one rule, five rules, 500 rules, but the number of rules must be finite. This, this R is a finite set. Uh, then number four is uh, this S. S is the start symbol, the start variable. Okay, so this S is a member of the set V. Okay, is this in clear? This is just a formal definition of a context free grammar. <clears throat> Any question? No? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we say that if U, V, and W are strings. Okay. Now you remember, uh, I mean, when we say strings, so we, we mean a string, just the string of uh, terminal symbols, right? But in context free grammars, uh, there are two types of strings. First is the string, the terminal string that is only composed of terminal symbols. But if we don't put the word terminal, then a string means a string of both variables as well as the terminals, right? So imagine that U, V, and W are the strings of variables and terminals. So they contain both variables and terminals, right? At the same time. And suppose there's a rule which says that A replaces or A substitutes W, okay, is a rule. Okay, it says that A substitutes W in the grammar. Then we say that, then we say that, that the string U, A, V yields, it yields, U, W, V. Okay, and we write this yield as U, A, V yields or drives or produces U, W, V. Okay, or in others, other words, we say that. <clears throat> is, it, is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is what we say drives. Okay, now suppose I have a grammar G. Okay, suppose I have a grammar G in which we I have defined everything. I know V, I know Sigma, I know R, I know S. Right? So for this grammar G, we, we have defined everything. Then we say that L of G, the language of the grammar is basically the set of strings and set of terminal strings. Okay, so when I say that it is over the sigma star, so sigma star means all possible string of the sigma, such that, such that S, which is the starting variable, drives that W. And I put a star over here. This star on this arrow means that S drives W in one, or more substitutions. Okay, so there is we start with the start variable. And with this start variable, whatever string that, whatever terminal string that we can generate, that string is part of the language. 
And this is exactly the definition of the language of the grammar. Is this in clear? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I just need to ask, is it necessary to start with the start symbol every time? Yes. Or can we start with any? Okay. No, when, when you start with a terminal, um, so let's say you start with a terminal string. That is a string con consisting only of the uh, terminal symbols, such as the string that we used in previous example. Uh, in, in order to check whether that string belongs to the language, you have to start with the start variable. What if, uh, what if it's not possible to make that string using the start variable, but string, it's possible? Yeah, and that means that the string does not belong to the language. Even if it's possible to start with the other variable and get the string? As, is, okay. as was the case over here. This string cannot be generated with this grammar or this string does not belong to the language of the grammar because we cannot uh, we cannot drive this string starting from the start variable a in one or more steps okay so when you put a star over here it means that one or more and the more could be anything okay one two three five finitely many okay it could be sometimes infinitely many uh, but it, one or more steps Okay, sir. Any other question? So let's do some examples. Okay, let's do some examples. So let's see, we have a grammar G and this G, so whenever we have a G, whenever we have a context-free grammar, we know that there must be an underlying V, Sigma, R and S. Uh, so sometimes these things are very obvious. For example, what is alphabet or what is the Sigma? Uh, but other things have to be defined. Okay, so we will define. So, so we over here we will define. So we say that this grammar G consists of four things, and that four thing is the the first thing is V. Okay, so so always the first thing is V. So let's say uh, the this there is only one variable, right? There is only one variable, and that variable S is S. So if there is only one variable, that variable has to be the start variable, right? The sigma. So uh, so I will write it in in a different color over here. I would write this is V. Right, and we have alphabet, and that alphabet is a B. So I would write that this is the sigma. Okay, and I have a production rule, and I would say that this is R, and I have a start symbol S, start variable S. So this S is exactly the same thing. Okay, so let us write uh, what is R. So R is a the set is it's a set of productions, and what are those productions? There's only uh, so since there is only one variable, so we say that S, so a starting symbol, single arrow. So single arrow means this is a rule, A, S, B, or S, S, or epsilon. Epsilon means that empty string. So this is our definition of R. Okay. So now we know what is this, uh, what, are, what are the variables. There is only one variable S. We now know what, what are the uh, terminal symbols. So there are only two terminal symbols, A and B. That is every string that will be generated using this grammar will have only A's and B's, nothing else. Uh, then R is the, the these three productions. So Y3, so we actually, we can rewrite this R as uh, S, A, S, B. So this is the first rule. The second rule is S substitutes SS. And the third rule is S substitutes epsilon. So these are the three rules, right? So there are only three rules in our in grammar. And since there's only one variable, so that variable is the starting variable, right? So let's see uh, what kind of um, um, what kind of strings this uh, grammar will generate. Can you tell me what yes, kind sir? of? Yes. Uh, the rules are always given with the grammar, right? We yeah, yeah. Have to define it. Okay. So, so we define, so, so I mean, rules are part of the grammar, right? So the question might be that this is the description of the language in words, for example, and then you might be asked to generate a grammar, write the grammar that generates that language, right? In that case, you have to come up with the rules. Anyway, so in this particular case, so if G is this grammar for some language, uh, can you tell me some of the strings which are in this language and some of the strings which are not in this language? Um, a S S S B is in the language. Let let me say that L is the language. So this L will contain what strings? Some string. Just tell me the terminal some string. Some strings. Can 
is empty string there is empty string part of the language yes or no yes 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 sir yes because empty string can be generated by the application of sub, uh, rule 3 and this rule 3 says that replace the starting variable with epsilon so epsilon is a part of or the empty string is part of the language uh, what else what what is the next string is there any string of, uh, size 1 ab ab right there is no string of size 1 okay then so how did we get ab okay we substituted epsilon e, yeah so we we substituted s with asb okay. and then s with epsilon so ab right okay. so so this one so let me write it in different colors so this one is using so this can you repeat how we got ab yeah i am doing exactly the same thing so this one using the uh, rule number 3 and this one is using s to asb to a epsilon b which is exactly equal to a b right so we have an epsilon between two characters means that this is a b so in so java so terms we can also on... have single s i guess why because s can be substituted with s s and one of the s in these two s can be substituted with an epsilon sure sure but what uh that that means that we are back to the square one right oh yeah okay doesn't make any difference anyway so let's say we we take uh, the second production which is ss okay so we substitute s with uh, ss and the first substitution first thing is with asp so we have s sorry so the first one is a s b the second one is just there we don't uh, we haven't done anything now replace the second one with this one the first one as well so a s b a s b right now replace uh, the first s with a s b so we would have a a s b b a s b and and the, now Replace this one with epsilon and this one with epsilon. So what we would get back? So we would get A, A, B, B, A, B. So this is also here. A, A, sir? B, A, B. It is also there. Yes. Uh, sir, is it necessary that in this language, uh, the strings only contain the terminals and not the variables? Every language contains terminals and strings. No, I mean the, the language that we're defining over here. Mm -hmm. uh, does every string in this language have to contain um, only terminals and no variables? Yes, every language contains only strings with terminals. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so this is an infinite language, definitely, uh, because if it was finite, uh, we know that it was. Uh, it is possible uh, to define it using a small regular expression and since so definitely this is infinite right uh, and these are just few strings that we could generate and we know that there are so many strings which we cannot generate using this language uh, for example can you generate um, uh, can you generate a string called uh, is is b a in this language l or not No, it is not right. So it means that whatever you have, the first symbol would always be a and the last symbol would be b. If it is not, uh, if it is not um, the empty string, then if, if the string is not empty, then the first symbol must be a and the last symbol must be b. It is impossible otherwise. Right. OK, so this string is not in L. Right? So we know there are some strings which are not in, in L and there are so many strings which are in L. Uh, if you want to give some give it some name, that's fine, but it's fine. This is enough. <clears throat> right? So let's let's do one more example. Let's consider a grammar G that contains a V, Sigma, R, and uh, E. So, so this is the set of variables, this is the alphabet, this is the, the uh, rules, and this is the 
the starting variable. And I would define this R here. Okay, so I will define this R here. So what is this R? So all the rules will start, the first rule will start from E and all the variables are coming from the set V, right? So the first rule is E replaces E plus T, okay? Or T. This is, these are the first two rules. And the second, uh, and the third rule is T replaces T multiplied by F or F. And F substitutes this E with enclosed in parentheses or just a terminal symbol A. Okay, so, so let me write, what is V here? So V is E, F, and T. So there are three symbols. So this is uh, this is our variable, the first variable, the second variable, and third variable. So what is sigma here? Sigma contains uh, what are the sigma? What are the uh, what are the terminal symbols in our in our in our language? We have plus, we have star, we have open parentheses, we have closed parentheses, and we have a. So these are all the strings in our language are composed of these symbols. Okay. And this is our R and this is our first symbol, start symbol, okay? So can you tell me some of the strings which are, uh, which are in this language, L? T. T, what, what is T? No, sorry. Um, no, sorry, wait. So in order to find a string here, you have to start with E. Right, so E has to be either E plus T. We can or, have A, right? What? Yeah, we can have A, of course. So A is the smallest possible symbol. A is there. What else? So rather than generating strings this way, I will show you another way. And I will say, I, I will write strings and I will say that, yes, it is possible to generate these strings here. So I would say A plus A is there. Right, a star a is there. A plus uh, a plus a is there. Okay, a multiplied by a plus a is there. Right, a plus a multiplied by a is there, and so on. So you can see that this is a language of simple arithmetic expressions containing just one terminal symbol a. I mean, some just one number a. And uh, or uh, and, and and two operations: addition, subtraction, addition, multiplication, and uh, parentheses. Right. So there are many expressions. So you can think about an expression containing uh, a, multiple copies of a appearing with plus and multiplications and in different manner. For example, a multiplied by a plus a multiplied by a is there, and and so on and so forth. So all these expressions are there. Now the question is. If I give you any one of these expressions and I, and I ask you, is it possible to, uh, to, to find a parse tree or a derivation uh, to justify that these strings belong to the language? Yes, we can do that, but can you do that? Yes, yes. Can you do that? For example, let's do this, do for this, A plus A plus A. So we can substitute A as You start with E. F. So which expression, which uh, rule you would substitute this E with? First one or the second one? Because there's these, there are only two rules starting, two rules in this grammar in which E is the uh, symbol on the left-hand side. So you could either e replace it with this one or this one. And since it requires plus, so probably you would not replace it with T, you would replace it with E plus T, right? Right now, uh, you can replace this e with the same rule once again, and you would get with e plus e plus t. Right now, in the yes. second, in, in the next one, you would replace this e with f. Uh, so you you would replace the first t with t, and second with t. So I'm I'm doing multiple uh, things at the same time. Keep it this way. Now from term, we can go to factor. So we have F plus F plus F. 
And from here, we can replace, we can apply this production F to A to A plus A plus A. Okay, so this is one derivation. Okay, and now you, I, I can ask you a question about this one or this one. Can you do it? Do it? Can you try it at your own? Yes. Please do. Is there only one student in this class? <clears throat> Remember the slavers has the partic class participation marks. What? Okay. So, so let's see. Uh, so let me write that that grammar here again. Only the production rules, uh, the productions, or the or the rules of the grammar here. That is e plus t, or e with t, and t with uh, t multiplied by f, or t to f, or f to e, or f to a. These are the rules, right? Now, forget about these rules for a second and, and look at the rules which I would write in blue. And so these are disconnected. These are two different languages, right? These are two different grammars. And I would say that E substitutes E plus E, okay? Or E substitutes E multiplied by E, okay? Or E substitutes E within uh, the parentheses or E substitutes A, okay? And let's say, let's call this language, uh, let's call this grammar G and let's call G1 and let's call this grammar uh, G2, okay? Then the language of G1 is exactly the one that we talked about uh, in the previous page. And what about the language of G2? What are the strings which are in this language? Can you tell me? Um, can so you tell can you please repeat it? Yeah, so the question is same. So it's, it's written over here. Can you tell me some strings in, which are in this language? A plus A. Okay, so A is there. A plus A is there, A times A is there, A plus A plus A is here, and so many other things. Is there any string in L of G2, or so we can write it mathematically. So my question is, is L of G1, since it's a set intersection with L of G2, is empty or not? Sir, not empty. Not empty? Okay, no. when you say it's not empty, it means that there is there is at least one string in L of G1, which is not in L of G2, or there is a string in L of G2, which is not in L of G1. Can you tell me that string? Right, so when we say the intersection of two sets A and B, is not empty set, it means that let's suppose A contains one, two, and three, and B contains three, four, five, then we know that A, A intersection B is equal to three, right? So what is this intersection over here? So we had A, A plus one, two. sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. A, A plus one, sorry. A, A plus A. A, then? Then A into A. So 
So it's the same string or different string? Different strings. A, A, multiplied by A. They are in L of G1 as well as L of G2. They are in L of G1 as well as in L of G2. Right? So can you give me an example? So when you say that, the answer over here is no. So there are only two possible answers, right? No and yes. If anyone says that yes, then it's fine. I will, I will ask that, okay, tell me why. Uh, and if you say no, then I would say, okay, uh, tell me one string which is present in both. Right? So what is that string which is present in both? A. Just A. A is present in both. And A plus A and then A into A. Sir, all of the uh, strings yeah, guess... of G2 will be present in G1. Okay, so next question. Uh, and that is, is size of L of G1 not equal to size of L of G2? Yes or no? So the size will only be equal if they both have the same number of strengths. Yeah. So you say that they, and that was the answer in the previous question. And somebody said that they both have exactly the same strengths, right? So the question it's is. It's still not necessary that the length of both of them is the same, not? even why if not? they have the same strength. Why not? Can you give me an example where it is not the case? Have you ever seen two sets which contain exactly the same strings, but the length? It's, it's not correct to say it length. It's, it's the, the right way is cardinality. Uh, have you ever seen any example of two sets which contain exactly the same elements, but their cardinalities are not same? Uh, no, no, sorry. I, I meant if the intersection is not null, then that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same length. That's sure, what I meant. So that, that's, that, but it, obviously, if they both have the same uh, strings, then the number of strengths in both of them is the same. Exactly. So in this case, the answer is yes. And but there is still a problem. So see, these two languages, these two languages, uh, would generate exactly the same kind of strings. Uh, from the grammar point of view, look very different, right? So this one has three variables. And this one has just one variable. And they look very different. Um, sir, can you please repeat it? Your voice just disappeared in between. It's okay. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, even though these two languages are generating exactly the same kind of symbols, same kind of strings, these grammars look completely different. In G1, we have three symbols. In G2, we have just one symbol. Right? So... Is there any difference? And we will talk about that difference uh, in detail in, uh, in next class, but let me give you one simple description. So let's say I have uh, A plus A star A, okay? String. We know that this belongs to L of G1 as well as L of G2. So this string belongs to both the languages generated using two different grammars. So the question is, <clears throat> When I try to drive this string using grammar G1, then I have only one option to follow. When, but when I generate this string using G2, I have at least two options to follow. And what are, what are those options? I will just explain. In the first grammar, we know that expression can be replaced by E plus T or T, which forces us to drive it or break it or parse it with this plus, right? While in the other grammar, we have E that goes with E plus E or E multiplied by E and so on, right? So it means that we can either break it at the star point, that is a multiplication point or plus point. So in the first grammar, there's only one option. So, so if, I, if I write the parse tree, it will be plus, a 
and uh, so, so let me write. So I would start with E and this E will give me E plus T. This E will give me T and this T will give me uh, F and this F will give me A, right? This T will give me T multiplied by F. This T will give me F and this F will give me A and this F will give me A. Now, if you read from here, from left to right child, so we know that we have A, then we have plus, then we have A, then we have uh, multiplication, and then we have A. So this gives us A plus A multiplied by A, right? Now, if you look at the derivation of the same string using the other grammar, so let's see what will be the case. So there are two possible grammars. So we start with E and we go E plus E. Okay, and then we we make this e a and this make this e as uh, e multiplied by e and this is a and this is a and this gives us a plus a multiplied by a. But now look at a different derivation for exactly the same string. So rather than plus, we go with multiplication. Okay, and this time we will go with addition. A, A, and the same. This also gives us A plus A multiplied by A. Look at the end result. End result is same, but we have two different, two different parse trees. Okay, two different parse trees. So two different parse tree means that there is a problem. Even though the languages are same, but it means that there is a problem. And that problem is called ambiguity. Okay, that is this grammar which generates multiple parse trees. If it, it is in this particular example, there are only two parse trees uh, for the same string. So in some other grammars, it is possible that we have two or three or four multiple parse trees for exactly the same string. And that means we call that grammar an ambiguous grammar, right? Ambiguous grammar. Why ambiguous grammar? Because it means that when we are driving, when we are creating a parse tree for a particular string, it is unknown to us that which tree to follow. Should we go with the first one or the second one, right? So it means that the, that the grammar is ambiguous. Uh, does it mean that if the grammar is ambiguous, it does it mean that the language is also ambiguous? No, it doesn't mean that because we have already seen that we have two different, we have some, we have the same language for which we have two different grammars. The first one is unambiguous, the other one is ambiguous. So it is possible that the language itself is not ambiguous, but the, the choice or, or the way we define the grammar is ambiguous, right? So ambiguity could be an inherent problem in the language as well. So there are some languages for which there is no grammar which exists, which is unambiguous. So in the next class, we will explore more about ambiguity and, and see that uh, what happens if you have an ambiguous grammar, how to deal with it uh, and things like that. And the second thing that we will do in the next class would be that given a grammar, for, so, so first of all, given some description for the language in, in, in English, for example, uh, how to generate or how to write uh, the grammar, the production rules. And from those production rules, how can we construct a machine that accepts uh, or recognizes that language? And the second thing that we will talk about is that uh, how to construct an unambiguous grammar. And if there is an ambiguity in the grammar that we generated, then how we can, first of all, detect and how then we can do some things to, to, to remove the ambiguity. So in some instances, it is possible to remove the ambiguity. In others, it is impossible. And uh, we will not go into much detail. That is mostly done and dealt in a compiler construction course. Uh, so we will not be talking about most of it. I mean, but we will talk about some things from, from that part. OK, so I will stop at this point. And if you have any questions, just let me know.
Any questions? No, sir. sir uh, yes. Can we say that G2 is derived from G1? G2, G2 is derived from, no. Grammar cannot drive another grammar, right? Grammar only drives strings. That is technically the wrong thing to say. In any yeah, the way, those, they, these two languages are exactly the same. Sir? Yes. In the start of this class, you were, you were describing that we use a PDA for context free language. Yes. So, sir, is uh, like Turing machine is applicable for all the scope of the languages. So, is PDA is also applicable for regular languages? Yeah. So, the thing is that. Um, you can always use a bigger gun to uh, to hunt a smaller thing, right? So regular languages can be accepted by finite automata, but finite automata cannot accept anything beyond its capacity, which is context-free grammar. So for context-free, you need pushdown automata. So a pushdown automata can accept uh, context-free languages, but it can also accept um, uh, regular languages. Then there are some languages which cannot be accepted by Context-free grammars or context-free languages and uh, some and, and the pushdown automata. For that, we define Turing machines. So Turing machines can accept and recognize languages which cannot be accepted or reject, uh, accepted or recognized by PDA. Uh, but then we can use uh, Turing machine to accept um, or recognize regular languages as well as context-free languages. For example, we know the programming languages that we have, Java or C, C++, are very powerful languages, right? So you can use these languages to construct any compl complex software, for example, the operating system itself or the compiler, right? So you can write the compiler of C++ within C++ or compiler of Java from C++ or the other way. Uh, so it is, it is possible to write a compiler from a, from a language. Uh, and, and, and a compiler is one of the most complex software, but you can use the same language and same compiler to write a very simple program that just adds two numbers, sure. right? So it is possible. Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, can, can a context-free language be regular as well? Every regular language is a context-free language, but a, not every context-free language is regular. Okay, sir. Right. Every person who is from Karachi is from Pakistan, but not everyone who is from Pakistan is from Karachi. Okay. So, so regular languages is a smaller set than the context-free uh, languages, and so on. So, there is another level which we call context-sensitive languages, and then there is another level which we call unrestricted languages. So. So Turing machine is a bigger uh, gun, which we can use to hunt down all those languages. So we do not need any more powerful machine than Turing machines. So the next topic so, is, is, is Turing machine. Yes. Uh, how do we define uh, context-free languages? What do you mean by define context-free languages? Like how, how would we know that this particular language is a context-free language? If you can... Uh, if you can describe that language using a context-free grammar, then it is a context-free language. And later on, we will see that if a language can be accepted by a, a pushdown automata, then that language is context-free, okay. like we did for, for the finite automata and uh, regular languages. Okay, uh, any other question? Um, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, I have a question from the from the P set. Okay. What is the question? Uh, sir, uh, there is a question which is uh, we have NFA to DFA So, in that one, we have made disjoint DFA. So, like one, so like starting, like this way, the other part, which is the other part, is starting state is connected. So, I will remove it. Just remove it. Okay. We discussed it in last class, last week. Anyway, uh, any other question? So I will stop my...
stop sharing my screen. Yes, any other question? Okay, in that case, uh, I will end the class. Thank you very much. I'll see you again on Thursday. Uh, no, no DFA can have two, st two start states. Right. Exactly one. Every DFA has exactly one uh, start state. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you again on Thursday. Thank you, sir. Take care. Okay.